Welcome to this edition of Diligence Inside Europe's Boardrooms. I'm TK Kerstetter and I will be your host for today's show. Today we're going to be talking about what boards should be discussing about governance and diversity and joining me as a guest is David Tyler who's the, currently the chairman of Hammerson and also the chairman of Domestic and, and General Group and just retired as chairman of Sansbury. So David, welcome. Well, thank you, TK. It's a pleasure to be here. So by all those chairmanship, you're certainly qualified to talk about um, any issue. But why don't we start by giving the audience just a feel of both Hammerson and uh, Domestic in general, what they do, and if you serve on any other committees other than being the chairman. Well, I'm happy to do that. Hammerson is a listed company. It's a public company. It's a real estate company with, it, with its investment in uh, shopping centers and other retail parks and uh, the like. Uh, very clear focus on what, what it does around Europe. Domestic in general is not listed. It's owned by CBC, which is a major private equity company, as you'll know, uh, and uh, therefore a very different, different governance structure. Uh, domestic in general offers customers, uh, members of the public, extended warranties. So you buy a washing machine, for example, you get a guarantee from the manufacturer, but that lasts perhaps only one year. Beyond that, we look at our, after it for you, and if it goes wrong, we repair it or we replace it. So that's what they do. And as you say, I recently retired from Sainsbury's, which is the second largest retailer in the UK, uh, another listed company. That was about three or four months ago when I stepped down there. So um, I know that you spoke to the Parliamentary Committee uh, on Corporate Governance not too long ago. Right. Yeah. And uh, you discussed the potential burdens of regulation and governance codes and uh, with respect to sort of investor options and the need for U.S. companies to be, or U.K. companies to be sure. competitive. So is it your belief that sort of companies in the U.K. are sort of walking this fine line between governance, regulation, and media, media sort well, of situations? Uh, so um, let me, let's step back. For the first point I made to that committee, and I'd make to anybody, including you and your audience, is I, I think the governance code in the UK for listed companies is extremely effective. It provides a lot of reliability for investors, and if investors want assurance about the way companies are run uh, in the listed arena, I think you'd have to look hard to find a better environment than that in, in the UK. And I've been a great supporter over the last 20 years as, the, as there's been successive improvements in corporate governance, um, uh, the code and the practices that, that, that go on. I often, for example, talk about uh, the fact that when I was first a listed company director, which is 30 years ago now, 1989, at that stage, the very idea uh, that uh, other members of the board should review the performance of the chairman, and indeed the board as a whole, was beyond the possibility. You know, these were great gentlemen, and not often ladies, let me tell you, chairing these boards, and uh, it would be thought of quite discourteous and uh, be, 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 be below, below the, uh, the, the ability of the board to uh, review their performance. Now, everything has changed. Uh, as chairman, my performance is quite rightly reviewed. Uh, every year uh, by the rest of the board. And you know, I feel a little bit uncomfortable when I go into that room and the senior independent director, as we call him or her in the UK, uh, gives me an appraisal. But it's quite right that I go through that and I'm sure that improves my performance. Ditto, we do these regular evaluations of the performance of the board as a whole. And sometimes that can get quite personal. But you know, time and again, I've found that those things have improved the performance of the board over a period of time. So I'd say as a preamble to your question, TK, essentially I think we made a lot of very good improvements uh, to the corporate governance processes in the UK and listed companies uh, over the last 20 years as I've lived through them. Um, so that's, just, that's the foundation. If I go on from that, I'm sorry this is a long answer, but it's a big question. Yeah. Um, what I would then say is there's now potentially a danger we're reaching a tipping point where some of these regulations, you have to start questioning whether they're really in the interests of long-term investors in our companies. Um, because uh, they can sometimes, I, I think, potentially give issues for listing companies. And my point to the Parliamentary Committee, as you said, um, uh, that, I, uh, that I addressed um, a couple of months ago on, on these issues, is that we may be reaching a tipping point where the merits of being a listed company in the UK 
can sometimes to some extent be put at risk uh, by some of these uh, regulations. And that's important because we all have choices here. We're living in a free world. Uh, companies can list elsewhere. They don't have to list in the UK. Uh, so uh, if, if companies feel there are concerns about this, they could think about listing in New York or somewhere in Europe or elsewhere. Uh, individuals, uh, individual senior managers have the option of working for non-UK listed companies, maybe in our private equity industry, maybe working for a subsidiary of a UK listed company and so on. And it's quite uncomfortable sometimes in the UK as a listed company director to have your remuneration unpicked uh, year after year uh, by the media uh, uh, you know, uh, in an environment that would be never seen in the United States, for example, or most other countries. And that sometimes means that the best talent can end up working in other sectors in the UK listed sector. And that is not the advantage of the investors in UK listed right. companies. So I, I'm just l looking at one or two aspects of this. I'm also aware of it from the point of view of the uh, small investor. Small investors can invest quite easily in the UK listed sector if you're a British citizen. But if you look at performance over the last uh, couple of decades, actually private equity industry on the whole, the private equity industry on the whole, has performed better. Now you can't access that very easily as a private individual. But if you are relatively wealthy and well, well connected, it is easier to, 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 to be in, in, in this sector. And therefore you are also worried that this system might begin to mean that the, 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 the more affluent parts of our investment community gets a better return because they've got the opportunity to invest in other areas that sometimes do better. So it, this is by all means not a black and white picture, but it's become grey now. And as I say, there's a tipping point there if we go too far. And I can extend that if you want, but already a long answer. <laughs> well, if this, I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to yeah. make you feel any better, yeah. but um, I would say that you're in good company because yeah. as I travel the globe yeah. and meet with uh, chairman of, of yeah. listed companies, whatever, um, certainly in the States, I hear the exact same thing, okay, yeah. that not pe people are choosing not to go public Okay, because um, sure. and or do IPOs because of the yes. uh, regulations sure. and have the same frustrations yeah. and, and worry. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure where somebody's going to go at this point yeah. to not have those kind of pressures. But um, I think the point is um, even somebody who has a code and a structure as good as the UK sure. does still is frustrated somewhat by whether um, things are going too far. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think there is sometimes that danger that it goes a little bit too far. A recent example for me was in the UK, we had a change to our corporate governance code in 2018, last year, um, and at the time I, I, I made uh, remonstrations with the uh, body that does this on one particular aspect, for example, which is that uh, for a vote at annual general meetings today, um, if you achieve a vote in favour that is less than 80%, let's say 75% are in favour and 25% against, um, you are required to put this on a particular uh, place, a marker, what I call a naughty step, and explain to uh, the, uh, the public and your investors why you still think it's a, a good idea, even though for the sake of argument, 25% of your investors voted against. Now this provides a wonderful means for the press, the media, who are not particularly well disposed in the UK to business um, uh, for un un uh, unfortunate reasons, um, to have a go at listed companies when this happens. But I step back and I say a couple of things. Um, why shouldn't investors disagree with each other? It's entirely reasonable to have two points of view on a whole range of things. And the point of our board of directors in a listed company is to make a judgment with all the information they've got and there'll be arguments in favour and against on many issues. Uh, and if you have a three to one majority, for the sake of argument 75, 25, 
What's wrong with that, I say? It's entirely reasonable, and we, we, we achieved a majority. Uh, so this kind of undermines uh, the, this position. And I, I, if you want to make a particular UK context of it, I won't be the first people to point out, person to point out that at the same time we had this major political uh, change in the UK potentially going on, following a referendum here on leaving Europe, the Brexit resolution, which was won by a 52-48 majority. And our politicians... Uh, very, who are in favour of Brexit, many of course are not, say that this is the will of the people with a 52-48 majority, a wafer-thin majority. And because of that, it is essential to avoid uh, problems with democracy that we leave, even though we're three years uh, later now and there's plenty of other evidence that's come to, to, weigh, uh, to, 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 to weigh the debate. So you've got that with politicians saying. On the other hand, you've got other politicians saying, my goodness, if you don't get 80%, you have to go and explain yourself um, in, in the p court of public opinion. So this is one example, uh, forgive me for going, going on for so long about it, where there's a danger that our authorities are just overstepping themselves and making people think, well, why on earth would I want to be a listed company um, if I have to deal with that sort of thing? So David, um, great point. Um, you know, uh, it was made um, obvious in an earlier show that somebody said, you know, if you get 60% of something that are very excited yeah. about that, normally you would feel good. It so is. to your point, the 25, 75, that 75 is very excited about the direction you're going, that, that should be positive, shouldn't it? Well, absolutely. And that, of course, is the way we run our lives in, in general. But also it, it, it's, the, it's the understanding that uh, naturally intelligent people can come to a different view about I individual issues. And that happens in business, just as it does in our political lives. Uh, and we should accept that uh, and uh, respond to that within listed companies. And I think actually we do, but some of these rather artificial governance code requirements undermine what the reality is. Well, David, I want to thank you for taking time. There is something else I want to ask, so we'll consider this part one okay. of our time together, and we'll pick up a little bit on diversity in part two. I want to thank you for taking the time, and I'll be back to you in a second. So that will conclude this edition of Inside Europe's Boardrooms. Um, we'll be back again when we talk about another topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. <laughs>